Hello and welcome to Short Tales, a series of short stories written and read by me, Damien Robb. We'll get to this episode's story shortly, but first, I want you to imagine a room. It's a drawing room, one with the Baroque decor of an old English manor. And despite the fire burning in the fireplace, this room is far from comfortable. The carpet has been torn up and replaced with timber both dark and cold. Most of the furniture has been removed and the walls are clear of decoration. All except for the one feature, on display high above the fireplace. Tentacles, mounted as a trophy, which stretch out towards the centre of the room. Okay, you ready? Good. This episode's story is entitled, Wall Mounted. The wall-mounted tentacles dominated the room. Not just with their size, which was immense, groping their way through the space above her head, but also their appearance, alien and wrong. They were a trophy, extending out from above the wide fireplace, its crackling inferno causing their shadows to flicker and twitch against the ceiling. Dina sat in a lush chair that had been positioned in the centre of the room, the perfect vantage point for viewing the horrible appendages. She'd never liked this room. Her grandfather knew that. The heavy door opened and Dina watched the old man enter. He marched, straight-backed, his body upright and rigid. An unlit cigar was clamped tightly between his teeth. He'd been forbidden from smoking the things after having half a lung removed, but that hadn't stopped him from chewing on them, gnawing away at the wet logs until he ingested them, piece by piece. The habit had caused his lips to discolour, behind which were teeth like chips of sodden wood, as rotten as the old man's soul. He stopped in front of the tentacles. Do you know why our family succeeds where so many others fail? Dina stayed silent. The old man's ego ensured he needed no encouragement. Fortitude, he concluded. Dina bit back the snide remark that burned at the tip of her tongue. She'd been hearing this speech since she'd first learnt to put on pants. It had impressed her at one point. Now it was hot breath from a stale corpse. He turned to Dina, eyes piercing, a typical turn in the speech, so much so that Dina could mimic the movements and intonations herself if she had such a desire. Instead, she resisted the urge to roll her eyes. It was always best to give the old man nothing, not a scrap of reaction, positive or negative. He'd find some way to use it against you. Courage in pain or adversity, he continued, moving on to the definition portion of the speech. Dina let her vision lose focus and blur as he continued to talk. She knew what came next. Her grandfather would drone on about how he expected more from a member of his family. She'd been twelve when she'd first been told those words, that Dina lacked his all-so-precious fortitude. At the time, she'd felt a pressure in her chest as strong as the ocean's depths. She'd held back the tears for as long as she could, and when they'd come, her grandfather had given her that look that Dina would come to know well over the years, the one that said her grandfather had managed to find a new bottom to the pit of disappointment he saw whenever he looked at her. The ugly sneer had rolled up the left side of the old man's face, and he had told 12-year-old Dina to stop crying or he'd give her something to cry about. He'd waited a second, then, when Dina's tears didn't immediately stop, followed through on his promise, using his gnarled knuckles to crack Dina against the side of the head. Now the words elicited no emotion. He turned to face her, and she let her eyes drift towards the thick cephalopod limbs. Her eyes ran the length of the tentacles which were pocked with grids of miniature craters and bubbled with mutant suckers of all sizes. In between were ribbons of ropey muscle. And there was beauty there too, the oily kaleidoscope of colours, which when alive was used for camouflage, but now was frozen in place. Dina followed its lines down toward the tip and found them impossible to follow. They were like an M.C. Escher drawing, one edge becoming another, creating an infinite loop. Trying to make sense of those lines could drive a person mad, as could the creature they belonged to. More than one soldier had lost their mind when they'd come up against the beast, either taking their own lives immediately or doing nothing while the creature did it for them. Not her grandfather, though. Not Francis Haig. Dina saw something move from within one of the tentacles' craters, something small and orange. "'Are you listening?' the old man barked. Dina looked back to see her grandfather's diseased mouth curl up into its trademark sneer. "'I demand your attention, Lieutenant!' She joined the military on his order, back when she'd still been interested in gaining the old man's approval. She'd fought on the ocean floor with the rest of the grunts, taking out swaths of the pale, needle-tooth monsters they'd come to call anglers. The work had been slaughter, plain and simple, 
as the anglers had become stupid and undisciplined without the command of their godhead, whose limbs now stretched above her. After four years of service and a promotion, Dina had left, much to the displeasure of the army and the disgust of her grandfather. "'They are organising again,' he said, gifting a hate-filled glare to the tentacles. "'Who are?' Dina asked. "'Who? It's pawns! Keep up, girl!' "'The anglers? But that's not possible. That would mean—' Dina followed the old man's gaze and saw another flash of orange. "'Exactly. It's still alive, somehow. Or there's a second one. I've told your old commander to expect you tomorrow.' Dina met her grandfather's penetrating stare. "'No. It wasn't a question, lieutenant. I'm not a lieutenant.' The old man brought his face to hers. "'You have a duty, granddaughter, to this family and your country, and you will fulfil it. Am I clear?' His fettered breath assaulted her nostrils as he spoke. No, she said again. Any duty I had is fulfilled, whether you acknowledge it or not. You don't care about this country, and you definitely don't care about our family. Dina thought of her grandmother, dead five years past. She'd been a victim of the old man for most of her life. Dina had never known her without a constant smile on her face, one that had been strained and belied by the torment that never quite seemed to leave her eyes. Dina was sure that the burden of being the old man's wife for so many years had led to her early grave. Her grandfather had barely seemed to acknowledge her passing. "'You only care about yourself. You want me in this fight because it gives you more leverage to have a granddaughter at the front of the action. Well, I'm not interested in fighting. Let them have the sea for all I care, and I'm not interested in being your instrument. Not any more. The only reason I came here today was to see the look in your eyes I told you so.' Dina permitted herself a smile then, a small quirk of her mouth. It had the desired result. The old man's eyes bulged with rage as angry as any sea. Dina moved to rise. He bared his rotten teeth. Sit down, he spat. You'll do as I say. I'll have your limbs hung up on my wall alongside the monsters. Do I make myself clear? Fuck you, Dina said. It may not have been eloquent, but she did enjoy saying it. If you want a member of our family to fight on the ocean floor, you'll have to do it yourself. He raised a hand to strike her when a spot of orange dropped from above to fall between his discoloured lips. She saw him swallow instinctively as he looked up at the tentacles with confusion. A shudder rocked the old man's body. He turned to Dina, who, for the first time in her life, saw fear on the old man's face. Then there was nothing, no expression. His face went slack as his pupils dilated. The hand that had been raised to hit Dina instead moved slowly to the old man's cheek, Yellowing fingernails dug into the flesh there and tore a strip off. The old man looked at it curiously with his two wide eyes, then smiled as he put the torn meat into his mouth. Dina stood and kicked the chair back as her grandfather let out an alien sound full of waves and water. She eyed the room for an escape. The old man was between her and the door and Dina wasn't sure if the windows even opened. The sound changed as her grandfather's mouth and tongue struggled to work together. Duh, duh, duh. Dina? she asked. I'm here, grandfather. Drown, the old man finished in a voice not his own. You shall all drown. He blinked wet eyes and looked around the room, examining it as if for the first time. His gaze turned to the wall-mounted tentacles. Proud fool, he rumbled. He looked next to his hands, which he held out in front of him. Expiring, he said, picking at the liver-spotted skin. His gaze then moved to Dina eyeing her from top to bottom. A poor replacement, he said. But it'll do. Dina swept low, seeking to knock the old man from his feet. Her grandfather's leg squished sickeningly against the kick, bending inwards as though filled with jelly. She looked up to see his eyes close. Waves rippled across his face, grotesque lumps rising and falling, disfiguring him beyond recognition. Not just his face, Dina realised. His whole body was roiling with some horrid internal flux. She scrambled backwards, too late. The old man's body mushroomed and exploded, releasing a sea of small orange pods. They rained down on Dina, a disastrous hail that smelt of salt and meat. They burned as they found her flesh. Dina screamed and then they were inside of her before she could even attempt to brush them away. What was left of her grandfather fell to the floor. The thing inside Dina opened her eyes. She could feel its thoughts squirm inside her head. It found the idea of breathing air repulsive. It craved a dark and never-ending pressure. For its body to be held in the loving arms of an endless ocean. For there to be destruction and worship. Dina tried to scream, but couldn't. She was a whisper, lost in a cyclone, trapped in the lightless realm of her own mind. 
The thing walked Dina's body through the old man's remains and out the door. The sea was waiting for it. Thanks for listening to this month's short tale. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, to finish this episode off, I've recorded some afterthoughts, which detail where the idea for this story came from and any challenges I faced while writing it. If that feels too self-indulgent for your taste, fair enough. But if that sounds like your kind of thing, then listen on. In a fast-paced world, every day brings new challenges and new opportunities. At Strayer University, we know a thing or two about getting and staying ahead of change. For over 130 years, We've been providing students like you with innovative tools and customized support. So you can find your way forward and always keep striving. Visit Strayer.edu to learn more. Strayer University is certified to operate in Virginia by CHEV and has many campuses, including at 2121 15th Street North in Arlington, Virginia. Of all the stories I've written, this has easily been the most heavily edited. The first draft came from the simple idea of its namesake, having a string of large tentacles mounted on the wall in the same way we'd expect of a stag's head or antlers. It was another one that I discovery wrote, meaning that I started with that one visual and discovered where the story led from there. For me, it seemed inevitable that it would be a horror story. The tentacles meant there was a natural Lovecraftian vibe to the thing, and I imagined them as giant, something that had been hacked away from some terrible eldritch horror. So, great, I had a genre and a vibe and a nice visual. But none of those things meant anything without a good character to actually drive the story. This is often the weakest element for me when it comes to planning a story. I usually start with a spark of an idea I find interesting, and it's only later that I consider the actual character whose shoulders that idea will be placed upon. Now, having realised this, I always take some time between having that initial idea and starting the story to at least consider who my character might be. The step here, i found, is to think about their relationship to the idea in question. So, for example, if our idea is that an enthusiastic scientist has somehow managed to genetically engineer pandas so that their breeding rates increase in order to stop them from being endangered, but then do too good a job of it so that soon the world is being overrun with pandas, who is our protagonist in that story? Is it the scientist? Or someone whose job it is to now hunt the pandas down? Or someone who's trying to save them? Or one of the pandas themselves? Or just someone whose day gets ruined by clumsy pandas constantly getting in the way? There are no wrong answers here, but each one is a different story depending on the character we choose. So, given that, we should choose the character whose situation will most likely reflect the type of story we're hoping to write. Then, with that decision made, dig a little deeper into who that character actually is. For me, I decided the person who owned the tentacles and popped them on the wall had to be arrogant and cocky. Basically the way I view anyone who kills an animal and displays their body parts as trophies. But that person felt more like a central character, someone interesting but not likely to have an arc. In other words, they were not the protagonist of the type of story I was hoping to tell. So instead, I decided my protagonist hated the tentacles. And what's more, they hated the person who owned them. And they hated that they were somewhat involved with helping that person put the tentacles on the wall in the first place. That they should be related felt obvious. So if my character had something to do with killing the monster who originally owned the tentacles, maybe that meant they'd been in some kind of military. And on it went from there. Alright, back to the editing. Like I said, I've never edited a story more than this one. And that's because I entered it in a flash fiction competition. This story, however, was not flash fiction. Hence the editing. The original was short, coming in at around 2,300 words, but for it to be entered into the competition, it had to be a thousand words or less, which meant I had to cut over half the words in the story. And I did. It took hours. I did pass after pass after pass, looking for anywhere I could cut or rewrite or reword or restructure. Mostly, I cut. Words, then sentences, and then eventually whole paragraphs when after about the eighth pass, I realised I would never get it down to the word limit unless I was willing to be brutal. Thing is though, despite cutting so many words, I never actually cut the story itself. Instead, I got it down to the 1,000 word version of this story. 1,000 exactly, it should be noted. It was a revelation. Truly a practice that taught me more about my writing than just about anything else I've done. More often than not, the sentences I had stripped back were better cleaner, more succinct but without losing any of the punch. It made me realise how often atmosphere and action are overwritten, and it's a lesson I've taken with me ever since. And while I still inevitably cut down my first drafts, it's not nearly as much as I used to, because as I'm writing them, I remember how much you can get across with so little. How often less is more. Saying all that, 
The 1,000 word version was not the best version of this story. Neither was the 2,300 word version. Instead, in the last week, I've rewritten it again, finding a nice middle ground between the two. It's the version you've just listened to, and which came in roughly at 1,700 words. All right, those are all my thoughts. But if you have any that you'd like to share, please do. You can write to me at shorttales.podcast at gmail.com or you can find me on Twitter at Midday Pajamas. And while this podcast will always be free, if you'd like to throw a few dollars, euros, rands, pounds, francs, yen, or any other currency at me to allow me to keep writing and releasing short tales and hopefully put out a few bigger projects down the line as well, you can do so by visiting my Ko-Fi page, which you can find at ko-fi.com forward slash Damien Robb. Or you can find the link in the episode show notes. Until next time, this has been Short Tales, and I've been Damien Robb.